international thought between Germany and the United States. Um, through events like today, our workshop aims to bring together our community and recently our digital community to discuss scholarship on global and international history. So if you're interested and new here in, um, and interested in our other events, um, please visit our website where you can find our spring schedule. Um, today's event will be recorded and will be uploaded with some minor edits to uh, on our department's YouTube. Um, please bear that in mind. And it will conclude with some time for questions, which will not be recorded. So if you have questions at any time during the talk, um, go to the chat button on your screen. My colleagues and I will monitor them and entertain, entertain them as many as time allows. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Um, Dr. Matthew Spector is an intellectual historian of modern Europe and historian of international thought in the 19th and, the, and 20th centuries. He is currently a senior fellow at the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley and a lecturer in history at Santa Clara University. His previous works include his various essays on the Frankfurt School and Carl Schmidt, and his first book, Habermas, an intellectual biography with Cambridge University Press. Uh, he is joined today by two discussants, um, befitting to the subtitle of this book. Um, my uh, my co-conveners and I thought it appropriate to have both sides of the Atlantic joining us. Uh, professor Anders Stephenson is the Andrew and Virginia Rudd Family Foundation Professor of History here at Columbia University. A specialist in 20th century US foreign relations, he is the author of Kennan and the Art of Foreign Policy, Manifest Destiny, and various incisive takes on the concept of the Cold War. Uh, also joining today is Professor Adam Toos, Catherine and Shelby Caleb Davis, Professor of History at Columbia University, a specialist in modern German history and prolific commentator of contemporary history, he is the author of various books, including Wages of Destruction, Deluge, Crash, and recently Shut Down. So today we'll pro progress um, in the following order. Um, first, with an introduction um, of the book and laying out the argument of the book by uh, Dr. Spector and commentaries um, following that introduction from Professor Stephenson and Professor Toobes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Spector. Okay, well, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and thank you to the center for the invitation, my hosts, Sakju O, oh, Jay Pan, Carolina Partiga, and Yana Eladen. Uh, and of course, to Professors Tuz and Stephenson for reading the entire book and um, uh, engaging with me here today. It's a great honor. I wish I could be there with you in person so we could decamp to the Hungarian pastry shop uh, or Augie's pub or, uh, or, or one of those, but. Uh, Alas, here we are. So thank you all for coming. Um, now, um, some of the attendees have read the introduction or all of the attendees I believe have read the introduction and conclusion to my book. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, summarize the entire arc or plot line of the book, uh, but rather uh, make a sort of a, an opening statement about what I see as the political relevance of the book today uh, and summarize 10 of its main uh, theses. Who would not want to describe their own political position as realist? The decision of generations of Western foreign policymakers and academic scholars of international relations to define themselves as realists is a way of rhetorically stacking the deck and dealing one of the strongest cards to themselves. In 2002, the leading IR realist John Mearsheimer pronounced Bush's war in Iraq not in the national interest. As Colin Powell, another realist famously warned of invading Iraq under the elder President Bush, if you break it, you buy it. Realism's currency is a master narrative associated with prudence, restraint, and a sense of the tragic gap between intentions and outcomes has only appreciated in the last 20 years of neoconservative ascendancy and exhaustion. The rise of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and the re recourse to classical realism by thinkers affiliated with it is a welcome development. I call these writers 
uh, like Andrew Basevich, Stephen Wertheim and, uh, Wertheim and Patrick Porter, representative of realism's dissenting face, or it dissents from the imperialism that realism has historically authorized. Now, to be sure, classical realists like Hans Morgenthau and Reinhold Niebuhr spoke out eloquently against the sin of imperial hubris and the ways in which the imperial adventures like the US in Vietnam failed to pass the realist signature test. Is this policy in the national interest? Imperial restraint, therefore, is far better than its alternative, the pursuit of US primacy. But I would like to see the cause of restraint disentangled from the baggage of classical realism or its late modern iteration, the North Atlantic realism of empire, whose historical development from orthodoxy to crisis and restatement is the subject of my history. Disentangling restraint, prudence, and other sensible virtues from the metaphysics of realism and its intellectual canon resembles what Richard Rorty counseled in philosophy as a retreat from metaphysical foundations. In Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, Rorty argued that the philosophers who claim to mirror nature in their reason would do better to give up their belief in the natural foundations for their politics and just get on with their work. Similarly, I believe we don't need a grand theory of realism to authorize smart policy decisions. Restrain yourself when you should, balance when you must. Common sense, prudence, what the Greeks called phronesis, practical wisdom can't be found in those doctrines and classics. Indeed, the realists can't even agree amongst themselves what the implications of realism are for the US vis-a-vis -vis China or Russia. Does realism entail defensive containment of China or offensive alliance with Taiwan? Why do realists think that China's pursuit of regional hegemony must be countered, but Russia's challenge to Ukrainian sovereignty is just a matter of respecting the spheres of influence of a peer great power? The so-called rules-based liberal international order that has anchored the US pursuit of global hegemony is receiving overdue scrutiny from within the US and a variety of challenges from the old revanchist Eurasian empires. But the challenges to US hegemony from the global South that begin with the era of decolonization offer a more hopeful theoretical tradition and vision for what comes after American hegemony. That the Chinese are reading Carl Schmitt should not warm an anti-imperialist heart. Strategic restraint and multipolarity are only a halfway house to an internationalism worthy of the name. The crisis of liberal internationalism and liberal order does not vindicate a return to realism because realism has never been liberalism's other. Entangled with modern imperialism, realism is not enough. The realist tradition in political theory writ large argues for the priority of order to justice, but it must make room for survival and imagination too. The realists have no real vision of the planetary, and a realism worthy of the name must prioritize survival above all. So now I'm gonna um, summarize what I think are the 10 main arguments of the book. Um, this is not a scientific measure. There are probably a few others that I've left out, but these are the ones I've, I've chosen to, uh, to emphasize today. So firstly, what I'm trying to do in the book is to historicize realism. Realism often presents itself as a timeless essence uh, of, of a, a timeless tradition uh, of global validity, but at the very least, a, a very ancient Western tradition dating back to Thucydides. And uh, I join uh, Nicolas Guillaume and other historicizers of realism who 
uh, who point to the fact that that canon, that ancient Western canon was really only constructed uh, in the 1950s and that thinkers like Machiavelli prior to that were not categorized as realists. So we have a very recent canon that has tried to anchor this concept. Um, and so I am in the camp that is trying to, to historicize realism and uh, uh, to provincialize it by, by treating it as part of modern Western tradition. Uh, and really in my version, a very foreshortened uh, 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 modernity going, just going back to the 1880s. Second, uh, I argue that realism is more than just the Germanization of American strategic thought. Uh, so I, I, I am deeply influenced by and, and take on board uh, with great admiration, the work of Koskanimi, Guyot, uh, Udi Greenberg on the Weimar century, uh, the argument that uh, the German emigres have a formative role on uh, American national security thought in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And that's undeniable. But what my contribution is, is to say that realism's German-American story is not unidirectional, it's actually bidirectional, and that the influence of um, the influence goes in both directions, that, that the influence of America on Germany is just as profound. And I look at thinkers like uh, um, uh, Alfred Mahan as someone who feeds into German thought, um, uh, for, for example. Um, thirdly, I, I try to resituate, or, or rather thirdly, by resituating realism's historical origins, I try to challenge our moral narratives about realism. By emphasizing the emigres and the shadow of Nazi totalitarianism, uh, uh, World War II and the Holocaust as the matrix of modern realism, um, these narratives have depicted realism as the saving remnant of the greatest tragedy in modern history. And there's almost a kind of fetish of tragedy that the tragedy of the, the mid-century uh, is, is transferred over to these great thinkers who can see, these chastened liberals who can see the tragic. So I argue that a historical account of realism challenges our moral narrative about realism as the Shoah's bitter fruit. Fourthly, my history challenges lazy associations of realism with realpolitik. As I show in my first chapter, realism was, an, uh, realism was an insurgent concept allied to Weltpolitik and was explicitly opposed to Realpolitik. Uh, John Bew it has, has written uh, very uh, successfully about the intellectual history of the term Realpolitik, um, but his purpose is to show the um, the many misunderstandings of Ludwig Brockhaus' uh, original uh, uh, 1850s uh, formulations of real up, real politique and to measure the, the sort of the deviation in, in how we use it compared to Rochau. Um, but what I have obtained, what I have learned from Rochau, sorry, what I have learned from you and, and other scholars uh, is that real politique um, was much more um, continentally focused. It didn't have the same emphasis on overseas imperialism that Weltpolitik did. And Realpolitik's primary value uh, was equilibrium and balance, whereas Weltpolitik uh, has a much more dynamic um, uh, 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 character that is related to the social Darwinism uh, of the era. So there may be a tradition of realism uh, as equilibrium or balance. You could think of Kissinger as someone in that tradition. And so in that sense, a Kissingerian realism might be akin to uh, uh, you know, that kind of realpolitik. Um, but um, I think that the, the main body of realism in the 20th century is, uh, comes out of Weltpolitik and um, uh, has nothing to do with equilibrium or balance. Fifth, uh, 
I try to argue that modern realism is the Bildungsroman of empire. It records the learning processes of two young states of rising empires, Germany and United States. And realism is a kind of mutation that results from the practices of comparison that those two powers engaged in, looking across the Atlantic as if in a mirror. Relatedly, I show that the Monroe Doctrine is an or text for both German and US foreign policy. And I uh, illustrate this through close readings of Mahan and uh, Carl Schmidt and Hans Morgenthau. Sixth, my history challenges the revisionist account of Morgenthau as a moderate or even progressive liberal. And as much as I admire uh, and have learned and studied uh, the work of my friend Bill Scheuermann on uh, Hans Morgenthau and um, the progressive credentials of the mid-century realists, um, I offer a different reading um, that treats Morgenthau as um, responsible for the creation of an orthodoxy that subtended the Cold War. And whatever regrets Morgenthau had about that, he must live up to his responsibilities uh, for uh, whatever misunderstandings of his work uh, occurred. Whereas the revisionist account of Morgenthau is that you know, he, 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 his thought was bastardized, it was misunderstood, and the real Morgenthau emerges as the critic of Vietnam in uh, 1965. Seventh, my, uh, my book challenges the fashion for counterposing Schmittian exceptions to liberal norms and connects Schmitt's idea of Großraum or great, greater space to the Nazi discourse on Lebensraum. And the purpose of that exercise is to argue that um, interwar geopolitics was, is not so easily separated from biopolitics. Uh, that Schmidt's defense at Nuremberg that he was doing science and was part of an international community of um, uh, scientific geopolitics uh, you know, is, is, not, is not an excuse uh, for, he, for the, uh, the, um, the ways in which his idea of Großraum uh, authorized um, the, the imperial biopolitics of Lebensraum. Relatedly, I construct a long genealogy of Lebensraum that connects political geography and the classical geopolitics of the fin de siècle to interwar geopolitics. Uh, so figures like Friedrich Ratzel, who coined Lebensraum, um, and connecting that to interwar figures like Isaiah Bowman and uh, Karl Haushofer, the, the dean of, of, of German geopolitics. And then I try to connect this up to uh, the sort of uh, the moment of American Lebensraum discussed by Neil Smith in his uh, uh, influential book, Roosevelt's Geographer, and the emergence of a global geopolitics, the US as um, uh, needing to learn geopolitics. And really one of the big ironies that I look at there is the, you know, that the, there was a kind of moral panic around geopolitics in 1942, that geopolitics was German, it was foreign, it was aggressive, uh, it was to be shunned. Uh, and, and within just three years, I show that American intellectuals went from fearing uh, and denying any uh, uh, comparability between American and German tradition to saying, you know what, actually we need an American geopolitics. And uh, that, that pivot comes very rapidly. And I, I trace that, that history of the American disavowal of geopolitics and then its embrace of it during the Cold War. Uh, eighth, I describe a crisis of classical realism in the United States and Germany that was transatlantic. I show how the, uh, the nuclear arms race, the rise of detente, 
as well as the rise of interdependence theory, um, all problematized the, the orthodox realism, the Atlantic realism, whose, gen, whose, whose consolidation I had traced up to that point. And I used that transatlantic crisis of, re, of classical realism, um, which is also related to the war in Vietnam and the international student movement, to explain why um, Morgenthau's uh, leading German student, Gottfried Karl Kindermann, uh, and his tradition of neorealism uh, remained so marginal in Germany. Uh, ger realism was never as successful in West Germany as it was in the United States, and I devote a great deal of time to explaining why, uh, the, despite the desire of Kinderman to synchronize the, the German, West German realism with American realism, uh, re Kinderman was too late, the moment had passed, uh, the moment for, for synchronization had passed. Ninth, uh, my book examines the irony that West Germans viewed Wilhelm Greve, uh, the West German ambassador to the United States and a former um, lawyer in the Nazi foreign office um, as a belated uh, voice bringing an American realism to West Germany. Uh, that had long been stymied by the oppressive hegemony of liberal and social democratic pieties. And this was really a misrecognition uh, uh, of realism to think of it as um, something that we need, that the West Germans need, West German conservatives wanted to learn from the Americans and thank God Greva is bringing it to us now because Greva had always been there. <laughs> the realisms on both sides of the Atlantic were thus bleibt what remains from the Third Reich in the form of Wilhelm Greve uh, in West Germany and in, and in the United States through Morgenthau. That Morgenthau is obviously not a Nazi, not a member of the Third Reich. He's a J persecuted Jewish emigre from the Third Reich. But I try to argue that uh, in different ways, the, the Third Reich is the central uh, um, conditioning you know, experience for, for, for the creation of realism. And you get these kind of misrecognitions uh, in both countries um, uh, of, of its origins. Finally, my book describes the waning of detente in the US and West Germany in the 1970s as the condition for the reassertion of realist fundamentalism or orthodoxy. And I think the, those who defend Morgenthau as a progressive have to contend with the fact that Morgenthau also embraced uh, this reassertion of, 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 uh, of geopolitics and of realist orthodoxy in the late 1970s. Greva too. Uh, and uh, I try to argue that, well, implicitly that this reassertion of realist fundamentals, of power politics, of geopolitics and so forth um, uh, it, it was not a positive development that it, um, uh, that it, that it covered over the important breakthroughs and crises of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and this return, uh, uh, prefigures our own moment, uh, of, of a reassertion of, uh, realist fundamentals and orthodoxy. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spector. Um, now we'll move on the, to our discussants, um, starting with Professor Anders Staffordson. Okay, so I've got 10 minutes, uh, lots to be talked about in this, uh, both in the presentation and the book, um, uh, from which I gathered quite a lot, especially on the German side, which I know is slightly less, even though I've done quite a bit of work on Schmidt. Uh, but in 10 minutes, of course, I can't say what I like about this. The main point uh, being that a, a commentator must always look at the critical points, what, that which uh, is kind of uh, dissent, as it were. Uh, so uh, I won't actually go, go into all the good things about this and all the stuff that I actually learned from it. Um, I also leave empirical questions aside. I mean, there are a number of issues here where 
you know, your characterization doesn't quite square with mine, but uh, that's not, uh, I don't think, what we should uh, preoccupy ourselves with in this uh, short time. First of all, what's Atlantic about these Atlantic realists? One question that I had uh, throughout, there is a constant reference to uh, the Atlantic and Atlantis, uh, if not Atlanticism, at least Atlantic, this and that and the other. Um, it's never obvious to me what is Atlantic about these realists, except as far as uh, transatlantically, if you want to use that expression, uh, there is an interchange or there is an interaction between um, geopolitical thinkers on one side uh, and on the other side, and there is therefore a, a conduit by means of the ocean or some such. But the Atlantic aspect of this, which disqualifies, you know, the archetypal Atlantic membership in this kind of uh, discourse, namely the French and the British, uh, primarily but not exclusively, is 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 a big question mark for me. What work does the Atlantic actually do? It different things at different times in the book. Different things at different times in the book. Um, uh, so, uh, which is also a way of asking, you know, people who actually did think geopolitically and civilizationally and uh, in any given number of different ways about the Atlantic, such as primarily Walter Lippmann, right? A, a, a person who always identified with some metaphysical qualities of the Atlantic, North Atlantic, I should say. Uh, and uh, traveled it frequently in the corridors of power. Um, he would sort of I, qualify, if you will, less as Atlantic realist, but I'm not so sure about the others uh, that are being invoked here. Uh, there is, of course, uh, an intimate uh, historical connection between the, the German Academy and the American Academy in the late 19th century. Uh, John Burgess and, and, and Dorothy Ross has written very extensively about the establishment of uh, graduate education in the United States as a German affair. And so, yes, there is a structural systemic even uh, connection between the one and the other at the intellectual level. Um, uh, so I can see that, uh, and I would have liked actually more about that. Uh, it is a, a very narrow spectrum in the way that you delineate this um, in the book uh, of people that are engaged in this, speaking of which or of whom. Um, so that's my first point, the Atlantic, what role does it have? Second question, speaking of oceans, Mahan. Mahan is very important in your account and delineation, but I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced that he's a realist and I'm not convinced that his spatial way of thinking about navies, um, even, even faintly realist, but not really uh, chiefly about that. He's, of course, uh, a historian of navies and naval power. And his big example is Great Britain in the 18th century and into the 19th century. It's not Germany, and he's not inspired by German sources. Uh, for reasons which are obvious, actually, insofar as he is uh, actually influenced by or talking to people, it's the French, it's Comini that appears in the influence of sea power, uh, not the Germans, certainly not Ratzen. Uh, but uh, in a wider context, Mahan is a civilizational thinker. He's a conservative in that sense. He's a civilizational critic of American exceptionalism. Navies exist in uh, a common space, if you will, blue water uh, oceans, uh, whether the Pacific or the Atlantic. And navies are similar, whether they're American or non-American. And much of the argument that Mahan presents is about civilizational power, uh, imperial power to be sure, but not in a simple sense. Uh, civilizational power, meaning that what's really wrong about the present you know, existing US position is that it's not recognizing, and this is the realist subtitle or sub element in, in Mahan's kind of argument. We're not recognizing that to be civilizational and a great power in 1900 is to have a great Navy, a battleship sort of Navy that is global in its reach. Uh, we have to stop being 
delusional or illusory about the way international power actually operates in 1900 by recognizing that we need a big navy uh, that then in complex historical ways is related to the British uh, original, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a it's a criticism, it's a critique really of of uh, what you might call American exceptionalism, which is a very bad term, but nevertheless. Uh, and it's, from that angle, it doesn't strike me that arguments about space and arguments about navies in themselves constitute a kind of realism, which brings me to the next point, the third point, which is about um, what's realist about these realists. It's a, a very uh, constricted notion of what constitutes realism that kind of in a circular way proves your point. I, these, these are the people I'm gonna study and these are people that are different from the traditional real politics, for example. Nothing, I must say, nothing can ever persuade me that Otto von Bismarck is not a realist. Uh, that is a, 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 an interesting argument that real politics is different. Real politics is different from that politics. Yes, I agree with that. But one from that, one cannot conclude that one is realist and one and the other one isn't. Uh, Again, arguments about space is a, is a specific kind of subgenre of the overall arguments about realism and international politics, I would argue, but I haven't got time to go into that. Uh, realism is always parasitic, you might say. It needs to have a delusional other in order to make sense. It's an argument about uh, the artificiality of abstractions in that way, it has an elective affinity, I think, in Hayden White's terms uh, with conservatism, that is to say, real conservatism uh, on the type that really derives from, but is not identical to Burke's critique of the French Revolution and superimposed in, imposition of um, stupid abstractions on the body politic, which is a natural animal. Um, and I think in the American context, all realist emphasis or all realist impulses rather uh, targets two, two kind of discursive others, legalism on the one hand and idealism on the other uh, in themselves overlapping. In that sense, realism is always a negation. Uh, in that sense too, I think, and this is something I've argued before, uh, it's always living on uh, what you might call borrowed time in the, in the context of the US, uh, because realism ultimately, insofar as it's based on any kind of prop positive propositions, as it were, argues similarity in the international space, i.e. there is no way that you can actually maintain, and this goes back to Mahan, uh, American exceptionalism in a realist idiom or in a realist framework. You, can, you, you must always recognize in the realist way of understanding national interest and international politics uh, as conflictual uh, confrontations between interests, constituted interests, as being essentially against uh, the basic precepts of uh, the American self-conception. The American conception being that there is an absolute difference when push comes to shove between the United States and the rest. Uh, even Canada, even the free world in general, there is always, uh, you know, ultimately a difference between the defender of the faith and the rest of uh, the civilized Western world, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, and I was curious actually why why the book didn't really go into, on the American side, what you might call American exceptionalism. Uh, realism as a, pol a political program and as a, as a way, of, way of being towards the world, as you get in Kissinger, for example, or more attenuated in Canon. Uh, is it can be a program, a, 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 a sub program, as it were, of the overarching framework. Uh, but uh, it has to be a success politically if it's going to uh, if it's going to endure. And so 
uh, when push comes to shove, actually it goes by the wayside in the American context, precisely because it's fundamentally, in my book, un-American. Fundamentally un-American. Um, on Schmidt, I, I, how much time do I have? Enough for about three, three to five minutes. Okay, all right, um, good. Um, on Schmidt and the Monroe Doctrine, which is, it's, and it, it's, for those who have only read the introduction and the final conclusion, uh, it's not perhaps apparent, but the Monroe Doctrine, and in particular Schmidt's take on the Monroe Doctrine, which is very, uh, quite original, um, plays, I think, uh, 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 if not a central role, an important role in, uh, in this book uh, as a reference and as a symptom and as an indication, an index actually, on uh, what is being referred to here as an Atlantic realist tradition. Is, is Schmidt's take on the Monroe Doctrine realist? Or is that the wrong question to pose? I would say probably the latter, because Schmidt is not really a realist in a classical sort of sense, or rather he's not a, an anti-realist either. It's not what he writes about. He doesn't write about you know, the morality or, or the problems of being realistic in foreign relations. It's there for, 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 to be sure, but it's not really his problematic. What's interesting about an original and very strikingly, uh, really, well, it's really a new, I think one, can, one has to say, is the, the temporalization of uh, the separation between uh, the Americas and Europe uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, the temporalization in the sense that, as he puts it, uh, what happens to the Americas is that it's invested with a temporal historical principle, uh, a stage, uh, an understanding of this space, the Americas, as fundamentally different in a historical tempor temporal sort of sense from the European previous historical stage. And it's the sort of Brezhnev, I like to think of it as a Brezhnev doctrine before it's, before it's time, i.e. Czechoslovakia is not going to re regress into the stage of capitalism, it would be doing violence on history uh, to allow that uh, to happen. And so in 1968, they kind of uh, presumably uh, invade to correct history or react reactionary moves backwards in history. That's essentially what, what Schmidt says about the Monroe Doctrine. And that's very interesting. That is extremely interesting. But is it realist? I'm not so sure. It's not about realism, after all. So I would just raise that question. Uh, and, and it comes back, really, Matthew, I think, to uh, what I see as a kind of uh, uh, slightly underdetermined concept of realism in this book. Uh, that, in fact, you, you avoid, it seems to me, uh, confronting that, that very fundamental problem what kind of discursive frame is this, or what kind of political framework is this? And uh, 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 this, is, this is more evident, I think, in the treatment of Hans Morgenthau than anywhere else. Uh, in the Morgenthau argument, uh, which I think is correct on the whole in terms of the politics of it, I think intellectually, Hans Morgenthau is just recycling Weber in 1948. Uh, it's much more Weber than Schmidt, uh, but then again, Schmidt is also influenced by Weber. I think if you look at the non-mention of Weber in the 1948 textbook, Politics Among Nations, it's clear that Hans Morgenthau knows how to avoid controversy in that sense, not citing Germans. Um, I, you know, if you look at most of that textbook and also his earlier work, uh, it's, it's, it's Weber through and through. Uh, 
I don't think that Schmidt was ever excited by moral questions of the type that, that Morgenthau comes up against in the American context. The national interest debate, which was the, the, the first way I got to Morgenthau, I thought was rather crude and superficial. And I can understand that classical Morgenthau realism in the 50s actually quickly goes to Kenneth Wall's neorealist alternative and eventually becomes much more scientistic. Um, anyway, I uh, greatly enjoyed this and uh, I'll stop on that note. I hope we've got some uh, material for conversation. Great, thank you, Professor Anders Stephenson. Um, I think it's sensible to move on to um, Professor Twos and then gather all these questions and starting points and then let, let you respond, Dr. Spector, if that's okay. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, Professor Twos. Well, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and um, um, to discuss Matthew's fascinating book. Um, and I found uh, your presentation, Matthew, and um, Anders's questions both quite illuminating, actually, in thinking through my reaction. I mean, I'm actually quite in sympathy with your avoidance of the questions that Anderson is, that, that uh, Anders is, as it were, forcing back onto the agenda. I mean, I take the intervention to be quite precise in the sense that we know what matters in the debate about the intellectual history of realism at this moment. There's a certain group of authors that matter. And I see the significance of your intervention as being, as it were, to, as you laid out in your, in your brilliant, well, in the text and in your summary of it, repositioning them. You know, you're, you're, just, you're saying, as it were, that they, we cannot accept either of the two flattering narratives that they like to tell about themselves and that are told in retrospect, either that they belong to some ancient tradition of wisdom in court, you know, embodied by somebody like Bismarck, or that they are, as you, as you put it so beautifully, as it were, the bitter fruit of the Shoah. But in fact, they belong to this toxic bit in between, which is Weltpolitik. And as such, therefore, there is a direct linear and logical continuity through to the 1940s, so that then the idea that Realism has to be imported to West Germany as a self-serving myth, because as you say, it's, I mean, this I take to be like a very powerful rearranging of the intellectual furniture. And, and it's very clear what it's doing. Does it answer the question of what ultimately realism is? No, I think it quite deliberately sidesteps that. And I think that also then goes to your, your very illuminating points about Rorty and your anti-metaphysical project, which I'd love to come hear much more about in a second. I want to step out of the way as quickly as possible, really, to get your answers. But if one proceeds in this way of saying, OK, what other history could we relate these people to? What other shocks might there be that might account for them? And if we, as it were, allow, in fact, in your comments now, I actually hear you saying, well, there could be a Bismarckian realism. And there clearly is a traumatised post emigre Holocaustal element. You're not denying the existence of those things. You're just saying that we also have to acknowledge the presence of this other of this other strand, and this other strand is the geopolitical strand, the belt politics strand, that's there too. So what else might be there is my next question. Like, so then my question was, and I don't know whether the right way to formulate this is by way of geography. If we think of, as I thought you'd very nicely put it, re, you know, realism is essentially the thought of great powers or the, the project of figuring out great powers. And then, as it were, the intellectual acts of comparison that emerge from that. And I take Anders's point about the underspecified dimension of the Atlantic, and he went to the British mm -hmm. case and the French case. Mm -hmm. How about another one, which will be Russia, very much on our minds right now? Right. And it seems to me that Russia could pose the problem in two different forms, like Russia in the classical realist sort of moral quandary type. In other words, who'd want to be allied with them? Aren't they primitive? Aren't they dangerous? Aren't they the shadow that hangs over us? The kind of Schmittian, you know, we live under the shadow of, Ra of Rus. Kind of that image, which, of course, is omnipresent all the way down to the, this very moment. But then, and, and is a specific problem for German statecraft. You know, when you say that Bismarck is a realist, one of the things that you mean is that he upheld a alliance relationship with the Habsburgs and the Tsar. And the Kaiser's, you know, Weltpolitik delusion consists in letting that drop. That's concretely what we mean. It's a willingness on the part of West European conservatives to turn a blind eye to the knout and to turn a blind eye to the backwardness and the authoritarianism of Tsarism and ally themselves with it nevertheless. 
That's, I think, what we in fact mean by the moral problem, problem of realism in, in, most, in many cases, is specifically the Russia question. As for François Premier, the specific, specific meaning of realism in the French tradition is, will you make part, you know, a pact with the Ottomans against the Habsburgs? Like, that's an egregious breach of any moral code. This is mm -hmm. the question, mm -hmm. I think, right? Um, but then, of course, there's another version of the Russia question, which is the revolution question. And can we really think, as it were, realism in the post, well, let's bracket the early period, because as you know, I'm, I don't actually believe that, I don't believe the Arno Meyer narrative about the 1920s. I don't actually think that Russia was, you know, the, the T-34 hadn't been invented yet and the Red Army wasn't a bulldozer. It was in fact a synonym for anarchy and collapsed the Russian revolution at that stage. But after, take your pick, Stalingrad, Kursk, as, and we know those are the dates because that's when the American strategic thinkers actually have to take the Soviet Union seriously. It's remarkably late, and it may be as late as Kursk in 43. But certainly by 45, you're dealing with a new force, right? The force that will make the Brezhnev Doctrine. And, and what does that do to the minds of your, and I agree with Anders, like deep down there's a conservatism here that's undeniable, and I think you agree with this as well. And, and and how does this express itself and how does that, as it were, shape what it means to be a realist after four? Is, is there another principle of unity here that is organized around that kind of moment? So not just in general and abstract, the turn of the century imperial problem, but the formulation of great power when one of them is the Soviet Union. And now, of course, the echo of that in the present is when one of them is the bona fide, legitimate, unrepentant heir to Maoism. Like, that's not the same as dealing with other powers, right? So that's one set of questions, and, and I just love to hear you more. I would think of this as augmenting, adding further layers to your mm. exposition. The other, this is much more tantalizing and sort of really goes beyond the frame, but it's there, and Anders touched on it, because another way in which you could define conservatism and realism with it is right, a set of claims about nature which are irreducible. This clearly goes all the way back to Burke. And you don't, I mean, in the, you don't mm. thematize this directly, Except that right at the very end, and I'm just, I want to know your, you know, your take on this. I mean, I'm very preoccupied right now with what it means to take a realistic position on climate change. What does it mean to be a realist in the current moment? You posed, as it were, in your setup, the point that presumably realism needs to be about survival, you know, and realism that really deserves the name should be about the survival constraint. And you say at one moment in your fascinating chapter about West Germany that, you know, one of the things that Ron Futzen contributes to the crisis of classical realism is the environmental question that emerges in the late 60s and early 70s. Mm. It's only part of a big cocktail, but it's there. And I just wanted to hear more about that. If there's more to say, it seems mm. to me, because environmentalism can be spun in all sorts of different directions, right? It's not for nothing that orthodox Marxists hate it because it's the reimposition of a Malthusian style constraint, which their entire doctrine is determined to overthrow. And yet here it is again. Hmm. And it's often nothing that there are various sorts of Wahlverbandschaft between conservatism now in practice in, in Europe and environmentalism, because it suits conservatives quite well in various ways. Anyway, I just would love to know whether there's anything there at the end. And, and I think it would be great for you to write an essay about that. <laughs> uh, I'd love an editor yeah. to commission you. And the, and the third point I had was, was 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 it was wonderful to have your setup and it wasn't the 10 points it was what you said at the mm. beginning the first like mm. five mm. minutes mm -hmm. where you got to talking about royalty because when i read mm. the text i read it twice for teaching and now again now and like the second time around i was just sort of trying to figure out what's matthew trying to do here and there's a way in which I thought, you know, he's engaged in some sort of act of purification, right? You're, you're engaged in this, you, you, Shoyam, it's when, when you're talking about Shoyam and it's most explicit, because obviously you and he mm. have you know, much in common. But what you want to persuade your reader is that his effort to sort of rescue realism from itself and recuperate it as a progressive politics is mm. doomed. And um doomed because i'm going to show you quite how toxic this stuff is and and you don't know how toxic because you think maybe bismarck or emigres whereas in fact i'm going to show you weltpolitik and schmidt and then you're going to realize it's so toxic you should really take your distance I, that is crudely speaking how i read it on a first take and then wonderfully you say and that just left me feeling that left me unpersuaded to be honest like no there's got to be a bigger intellectual stake here than mm -hmm. that just like throwing out bad old baggage won't work 
So mm -hmm. now you come with royalty and you say what's really at stake here is to strip all the metaphysical baggage away. And then you end up with all these sensible words, which we can't help using like common sense and just doing our jobs and that kind of pragmatic move, which I get it's itself presumably struggles to disentangle itself from metaphysics. But anyway, let's just grant that for a second. But I'm also like, mm. what about, what about, yeah, does this, does this, I mean, it's, that's really clarifying in terms of your purpose. And, but I checked the text, Rorty's not mentioned as far as my, nope. my PDF search, he's not there, right? Okay, so it's not, nor is metaphys, nor are the metaphysical stakes really exposed in the way you did. I, again, I would encourage you okay. to like lay that out because it's really, now I get it. But then it just left me thinking, mm. right, do I really believe in the possibility of this? Like, I mean, if you, what, if, what if you start with Gadamer instead? What if you, if you, if you sidestep Anders' question, which is how I granted you first on, and we just say we're in basically in a discursive textual zusammenhang, right? A set of interconnections. And within that, you're positioning yourself. And within that, you're saying, look, I can tell you something about the history of this zusammenhang, of this interconnection of text you didn't know before, and it's going to change your mind. But does it really allow us to shed baggage in the way that you want us to shed baggage? Or are we not inextricably, in a sense, tied up with these folks, whether we like it or not? That's kind of what I'm, that's mm. kind of the, now I see what the stakes are. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that those are the stakes, but, but I'm not like, can we really do it? I mean, of course we can at some level, but maybe this is another way of explaining why you know, you've got figures like Batchevich hanging around the Stephen Vertine project and the Quincy Institute. And they said they are for me, rather than doing this process of sorting out, you know, realism into more or less, you know, palatable and worse traditions, which are worth saving what's, you know, what's, what's alive and what's dead in the realist tradition, that intellectual history question. From a, from a Gadamerian kind of hermeneutic point of view, like nothing's ever quite dead, right? Nothing ever, nothing, absolutely nothing is ever quite dead. Um, and on the other hand, of course, how lively is any of it? But anyway, that's, that was my, that's more a comment and a question and a query. And like, I'd love to hear more on that line. Thank you. But it's been such, it has, as Anders said, been very thought provoking. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Anders and Adam for some of the, the best comments and, and, Can anyone hear Matthew? I can't. He got muted by accident. Sorry, sorry, I'm back. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, I don't know how that happened. Uh, so thank you, Anders and Adam, for those uh, very probing, trenchant, and and helpful uh, uh, comments. Um, um, I guess um, I guess I'll just start with Adam and then work my way backwards. Um, so. Um, yeah, what's alive and dead in, in, uh, um, well, in terms of the, the sort of the specification of the object of analysis and whether it's circular or, you know, what, why, why is it narrow? Is it broad enough? Uh, what, you know, what's the principle of selection of my realists? I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that, um, I mean, the project begins with the fact that Morgenthau is a hero to all American realists, classic to, to um, I mean, the neo-realists, you know, tried to break with some of his metaphysics, his, his investment in, in, in uh, human nature, but uh, Morgenthau remains the most cited thinker in, you know, in IR theory, he's, he's sort of the grand old man of this tradition. So I think, and, um, you know, Schmidt may not have been interested in realist questions, but realists were interested in Schmidt, right? And Morgenthau is clearly, you know, we, we know that there's a direct uh, meeting between the two men and that Schmidt actually amends the 1932 you know, he amends his book, The Concept of the Political, after reading Morgenthau's dissertation. That's all documented. 
Um, yes, Morgenthau, there's a lot more to Morgenthau than Schmidt. There's Weber, there's Kelsen, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, but um, I think that Schmidt belongs at the center of the book because he is the, um, I think I've, I've tried to construct an intellectual genealogy that context, connects the Monroe Doctrine all the way to the end of the Cold War. And that, um, you know, Schmitt's, that, that thinking about spheres of influence and, um, you know, you, you can draw a clear line from, from Schmidt on Großraum to, to Mearsheimer on Ukraine. I think it's, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So for me, Schmidt belongs right in the center of the, the conversation. Um, with regard to Mahan not being a realist, I mean, I guess I, I, I take your point, Anders, that talking about navies and space doesn't make you a realist. And, and, but, um, and there is a critique of US exceptionalism. Um, um, his concern is really for the survival of Western civilization versus a, a kind of Asian threat. And yet, and yet he uh, very much uh, reiterates American prerogatives in the Caribbean and the control of that isthmus uh, as a way of, as part of that civilizational project, that, 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 that the Monroe Doctrine is, uh, is sanctioned by that broader uh, Western civilizational project. So, and I think, yeah, so I don't see realism versus civilizational thinking as an either or. Um, now, you, Anders also asked me, what's realist about my realists? Um, and, and he mentioned, or you mentioned that for you, what realism is, is a set of negations of, of legalism, of idealism, of the artificiality of abstractions. And that's precisely what I show uh, Mahan is up to through my, my close reading of Mahan. I really think that Mah Mahan is a unappreciated Ur text for the discourse of realism. I mean, I don't engage in a priori uh, definitions of what is a realist and let's go, um, you know, I, I sort of begin in the stream, right? In the discourse um, as I lived it, right? I mean, I, you know, I went to college and learned about realism like every other IR student, there are three, you know, there are only two major paradigms that are taught to every IR student in the country. And through the globalization of American IR, which has dominated the field, and one of them is realism, right? So this is an intellectual, a critical genealogy of the making of a paradigm uh, of a, a, that is both uh, academic and the common sense of policymakers. And it's both intellectual history and cultural history. I'm trying to look not only um, at explicit theoretical formulations of realism, but also some of its cognates. So when people talk about, you know, uh, a realistic foreign policy, uh, and I try to show the moments in which this discourse is consolidated um, in the, in the um, late 1940s and 50s. And I argue that there's a kind of, um, because you can see in some of the texts of the period that, that realism is still in quotes and, and you have you know, Malcolm Cowley and uh, uh, um, Franz Neumann sort of saying, you know, what is all this talk about realism? It's, it's um, and so I try to show that real, there's a discourse on realism um, that um, you know that that, that is a, a cultural fact, um, and that 
that part of the attraction of realism as discourse was that it was a kind of what I call a semantic refuge from geopolitics, that geopolitics had been tainted by its associations, uh, that it was seen as foreign and other and German. And so anyway, but I, so um, now coming back to um, realism is not compatible Real, Anders, you say realism is fundamentally un-American because realism is not compatible with American exceptionalism. I mean, this is the, this is the great progressive claim of the realist today is, right, the, 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 what the Quincy Institute people would say is, look, if you look at the world through a realist lens and you understand that Russia and China have interests just like us, then you'll be less belligerent because you'll, you'll you know, you'll stop looking at things through a moralizing lens. You'll you'll recognize that 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 you are just a peer, great power among great powers, and everyone has their interests. But I think what I was trying to show in the book is that um, realism does get allied to national exceptionalism. Uh, first, in Nazi Germany, <laughs> where where uh, the, the Großraum gets entangled in, uh, uh, you know, a German, a unique German vocation, right, to have a Germanic Monroe doctrine in Europe, to, to conquer, to lead the world, that's, a, that's an exceptionalism. And then I think during the Cold War, that realism is both authorizing American exceptionalism and intention with it, right? I mean, clearly the Cold War um, uh, is sustained, the American posture in the Cold War is, is sustained uh, by messianism, right? A crusading uh, messianism. And so Morgenthau and Niebuhr uh, and, and other um, realists push back on that moralizing face of American empire. But at the same time, I think, I think it's not wrong to say that realism did have something to do with the Cold War uh, because of the proximity, uh, you know, because of Kennan, um, uh, because of, uh, you know, Morgenthau and Kennan were very uh, important in, in, in policy circles. And then you have um, the whole Kissinger tradition. So I think that and, 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 and then, of course, just more broadly speaking, um, as I said, my lived experience of realism was that in the 1980s, you know, it was on realist grounds that the Reagan administration uh, justified its alliances with apartheid South Africa. Um, and it said, look, it's not in the national interest for us to work with Mandela or the African National Congress. So I'm, I'm doing a, a kind of critical genealogy of the work that the concept of national interest has done in the Cold War and tracing it back to Mahan, uh, who has this, um, you know, who, who also I think is one of the first thinkers to formulate uh, the idea of, Amer of a nation having vital interests. And so I get into sort of vitalism and Weltpolitik. Um, and then I guess just in, in conclusion, what's Atlantic about it? It's a good point. I mean, I think that, you know, what's really what's Atlantic about my Atlantic realists is that they are, that they are, um, well, it's, it, it's, it's the history of a transatlantic conversation. Um, so in that sense, I think, you know, transatlantic is Atlantic. Um, I also think that you I mean, I certainly could have done more or more could be said about North Atlantic Atlanticisms. Um, but I do talk a little bit about, um, it, the making of Atlanticism in West Germany in the early in the uh, in the 1950s through the, the 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 German foreign policy think tanks. Uh, it really just wasn't my topic to to, to look at to do a genealogy of of, of Atlanticism as an identity. Um, and as you say, there there are good sort of prima facie grounds for focusing on the German American link as opposed to uh, the French and the British 
um, as Emily Levine has shown in her new uh, history of the, um, the modern research university, there's a really a unique intimacy of the American and German experiences. And, um, you know, I, I try to, even though I have a narrow cast of characters, I'm relying implicitly on, uh, you know, other works that connect those two national traditions. I also just, in, in the last thing I'll say is that I would be delighted, my, my German American uh, history of Atlantic realism uh, is not designed to uh, forestall alternative tellings of Atlantic realism. And I think a, a French British uh, history of Atlantic realism um, would, um, there's room for it. it. It could complicate my narrative or support it. Um, and, and then I guess finally, just to go back to Adam's thing about uh, Rorty, I mean, I, I wasn't thinking in Rortyian terms when I wrote the book. This is kind of a post book thought. But what I wanted to, 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 to emphasize is that there is a dissenting face to realism, right? And, and, and I'm mainly telling the story of realism's, realism as an orthodoxy. There is a dissenting, and that orthodoxy is imperial. There is a dissenting anti-imperial tradition of realism. And if, if that's where you want to go for your intellectual nourishment, um, you know, that, that's, that's great. Um, but it's still, um, you know, it's very clear in Patrick Porter's book that if you want to, if you want to rely on an argument that power politics is hardwired into international relations, I think that's a double-edged sword, right? You can say, I don't think, so I, I think it's kind of a poison chalice, you know, uh, that, that doesn't hold as much, um, you know, it doesn't offer as much to us in, for our needs, uh, for justice, peace, survival, and, you know, this trope of the, 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 the eternal return of the tragedy of power politics, of great power politics. This is what, what Mearsheimer's book is called. I, I think power politics, great power politics is a comedy. This is, a, this is an endless return of, this is, a, it's a discursive comedy that we are uh, stuck on this. Uh, and so I'm in a more constructivist spirit to say, look, uh, what is a great power? What is national greatness? Um, you know, how does, is, is there an ontology of power that works independent of human agency? Is it, is it hardwired into the oceans and the, and the continents? Thank you, Dr. Spexer. Um, we've got, few remaining time so we would we will I would like to entertain some questions if you have questions you can raise your hands um, I have certain questions about especially uh, about alternative or the other canon that we might be able to build based on your refutation of this imperialist core of realism uh, but before I use the moderator's privilege So um, maybe this is a kind of a broad question about your next project, which you might, which I presume you might build on to this book. Um, especially, I was really excited to read the the later chapters on West Germany, and you you do briefly touch about um, some alternatives that have collab um, influenced on the crisis of realism. Um, will can you? Kind of elaborate whether the peace studies um, that mushroomed in the 60s, 70s, whether that could be an another canon or are there any other trajectory, trajectories that you would like to um, lead us to face and more delve into? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, one reaction I got to my book um, was uh, who are the heroes 
<laughs> where are the heroes? They're all, you know, is it just, uh, <laughs> you know, just, just labeling the whole area a toxic waste dump? <laughs> just let's, let's, let's be, <laughs> I mean, Adam, you, you said that you weren't, you didn't find that, that, that uh, kind of um, uh, rebuke of the, of the tradition um, uh, compelling. I'm not sure why, but that, because that was an important part of, uh, of the project to, 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 to say that this tradition um, has imperial coordinates. It's, uh, it's not neutral. It's, uh, it doesn't come from where you thought it came from. I, I think those are important interventions. But the thing um, about traditions is that you cannot easily dissociate yourself from them. That's the ah. wisdom of the Gadamerian point, is right that it's a that it's a self deception mm, uh, to imagine that we can so easily pick and choose. I see. Okay, I'll have to think more about that. Um, but with regard to Sakju's question, um, there are you know I I became interested in. Um, there were glimmers of a left realism that I wanted to, to understand and research further. Um, Charles Beard, for example, um, sort of ended up on the cutting room floor, but what Charles Beard learned, uh, Charles Beard was writing against Franklin Roosevelt's navalism, and he was directly influenced by um, Eckhart Kerr, uh, and the Karaite critique of uh, Wilhelmine uh, uh, navalism. Um, uh, Beard wrote a really important and kind of neglected book in 1934 called uh, The National Interest, uh, which is which I found I found a kind of a revelation. Here, here's a deconstructive you know, reading of the national interest. Um, so figures like uh, uh, Beard, um, I think uh, um, Alfred Wacht, who was, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain his exact intellectual, I believe he was a student of Mendelssohn Bartholdi in Weimar, and he's an independent scholar in the US. And he wrote some very uh, probing, and critical things about geopolitics and the balance of power in the 1940s. Um, and then critical geopolitics, figures like Yves Lacoste are intriguing to me. I mean, I think I try to kind of argue that a lot of geopolitical thought is very primitive and problematic, but I don't think we can, I, I do think that so I want to understand the intellectual history of critical geopolitics better. Uh, and then with regard to peace research, yes, I, I, I really do want to go more into the thought of people like Ernst Otto Chempel, Dieter Senghaas, uh, because I think that that whole tradition, um, uh, there's been too much condescension towards that tradition as being naive about Soviet power. And I think there's, um, yeah, I mean, th there is a moment where, um, you know, Marcuse and Fromm are in direct dialogue with, uh, with Morgenthau and Hans Speyer. And um, that, was an that was an inspiring moment that I, I would like to try to recover. Um, and there is a tradition of critical international, critical theory and international theory. Um, there, there are a lot of people you know, so there's a lot going on in IR with post-colonial critiques of international relations, thinking about uh, IR theory. So I'm I'm interested in in you know going deeper into contemporary IR theory and um, looking for um, usable intellectual histories to sustain it. I'm also doing a project on Margaret Sprout, who was a um, a, uh, a realist um, based at Princeton, part of the, that, that 
that Princeton scene with um, uh, uh, um, uh, Earl and, and, and others um, in the 1950s, uh, but who became in the course of her career, uh, an ecologist. And in her book, Towards the Politics of the Planet Earth, uh, she engages in an Auseinandersetzung with her earlier realism and geopolitics. And so I'm really fascinated with her. And um, I'm also very interested in the work um, on women and international thought that is coming out of um, Oxford and Sussex through a Leverhulme project uh, grant that's just wrapped up, Patricia Owens, Katarina Rietzler. And there's not only a volume on women's international thought from Cambridge that came out this year, but there's now an anthology, a 700 page anthology of neglected female figures in the canon. And this is another big problem, I think, with the realist canon is that it is highly gendered and I try to sort of do some work on the rhetoric of the realists, the, the, you know, the man who can face hard truths and realities, and it's always a man. Um, and um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Specht. I'm, I'm afraid I need to entertain only one question. There's a question from Thomas Laney, um, since we have um, since I think fa there's a faculty meeting right after this. So um, I'll entertain a question from Thomas Maney and then we might have to. Um... Um, thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, I just wanted to press you on one point that, um, that Adam raised um, briefly, um, which is um, just thinking about realism, realist relationship to this ecological question, right? And I've just been thinking about this a little bit, you know, and and what Adam was saying about how there's a there's an attraction to the problem that the climate crisis or the environmental creates a limit or a, a a problem that you have to bang your head up against, and you know Kennan has has is is a kind of classic example of this. And in seventy one, Kennan writes that essay um, to prevent a world wasteland, right? And he's very excited about the climate problem sort of arriving on the scene. Because he points out, you know, the United Nations is not going to be helpful here. It's set up to be a developmentalist institute. You know, it can't, not everyone can be involved. Like, this is going to have to be a great power, you know, great power solutions are going to have to be worked out for this, right? And it's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, piece to read now, you know, when you think about ideas of, of China and the U.S., you know, coordinating to solve the climate and I'm just thinking too of, of Anatole Levin's book, you know, Climate Change in the Nation State, right? Which is again, you know, he's thinking in the same kind of way, like, thank God there's this kind of constraint that we now have and we can, we can fit the tradition into this new problem, right? And I'm just wondering if you see, Matthew, a way of, 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 of extracting a kind of history of, of, you know, realism or realist relations with this other, with this other problem and whether there's some kind of, you know, a history that could be excavated along those lines, um, you know, going back, I don't know when you would start it. Um, well, it, it, I mean, it, it has not been a focus of my research and it, it's not something that I'm as engaged with as, uh, as Adam is. And so I, I, I don't really have much to say, but, um, I mean, I guess the, the first thing that comes to mind is that Morgenthau and other realists, uh, part of what created a crisis of classical realism was they're facing nuclear catastrophe, right? And the sense that the, that, uh, the, the wizards of Armageddon were not going to save us, that technocracy was, was problematic and that there was a, there was a kind of shared uh, planetary uh, uh, threat or crisis, which which threw us back on ourselves. Um, so I guess I would that's where I would begin to look for a planetary realism or a climate realism. Um, but I, I I think I also heard a, you alluding Tom to a kind of and Adam both a, a sort of tension between my call for more imagination. But also, in, in with regard to environmentalism, more recognition of constraint, 
and and maybe those two are pulling in 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 different uh, directions and um so but it, it's it's something i i would certainly need to give more thought to Kennan, of course, begins this in the 1930s, partly in conversation with Mumford, and as an anti-urbanist, uh, an anti-modernist, he has a very clear-cut foundation to stand on in that particular uh, in that particular respect, and that's why he can also cast his opposition to nuclear weapons after 1950 in the same terms. Um, thank you. I think, yes, we are out of the time. Um, thank you for again for coming to today's event. Um, next week, we are going to have a paper presented by. Oh no, next week we won't have an event, and the next event will be two weeks after this. Um, so please stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you, the conversation. Thank you for great. coming. Really fascinating. See you, everyone.